Welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Series, now the world's largest and fastest growing weekly newsletter dedicated to leadership development, management development. If you're not subscribing, we'd love to invite you to do so by visiting franklincovey.com and click on the On Leadership tab. My name is Scott Miller and I serve as your weekly host and interviewer. Today's guest is the author of the powerhouse book on management called The Making of a Manager, What to Do When Everyone Looks to You. Julie Zhu, welcome to On Leadership. Hi, Scott. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. Julie, so honored that you joined us today. First of all, you serve um, during the daylight as the uh, VP of product design at Facebook. You also are the author of several books, including the Wall Street Journal bestselling book, The Making of a Manager, which I hear is also Amazon's number one book this year for business. Congrats on both those credentials. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be able to talk about a topic I'm so passionate about, leadership and management, uh, with you know people far and wide. You know, I'm often asked by our viewers and listeners, why do you have guests on to have a competitive book to Franklin Covey, right? We've been in business for 40 years. We're very passionate about leadership and management. And my answer is always the same. You know, one of Dr. Covey's legacies was to have an abundance mentality. And we're not scared of any competition. We hope all the competitors actually you know, increase their influence because it increases the competency of leaders and managers. And although you're not in competition with us, you've written a very pointed, inspiring, practical book on what to do when you're a manager. So we're delighted to give you a platform for all of our customers. I want to ask you first, why did you write the book? And did you struggle with the title being the making of a manager, because as you know, we've talked about this sort of uh, you know, ongoing debate between leadership and management. Uh, talk a bit about why you wrote it and how you titled it. Absolutely. So my story, my own journey into management started when I was 25 years old. And I had joined just a few years ago a rocket ship startup, which was Facebook. And I joined when we were about 100 people. And so, you know, you can imagine it's a small group of people. We were all very passionate about what we're doing. We're working around the clock. You know, we're wearing many different hats because we're trying to get our service to be successful and valuable. And you know, we were we were doing quite well. And so, as companies do, we grew. And as we grew, suddenly, you know, we more and more people were joining the company. And that was when my manager turned to me and said, "Hey, you've been here for a few years, and guess what? You get along with everyone on the team." So how about it? How about you manage, you know, the half of the team with me? And, you know, at the time I said, sure, because again, this is a startup. We're all used to doing things we've never done before uh, in the service of, you know, building this dream that we had. Uh, and it wasn't until weeks, months, years later that I realized I was totally unqualified for the job and I had no idea what I was really doing. Uh, and I remember this journey because, you know, I sort of had to learn fire. I had to learn through the process of, you know, growing uh, with the company, growing with our products, growing, you know, from 100 people to, you know, today we're 40,000 people. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of those lessons, you know, were learned from making mistake, mistake after mistake. Uh, and when I look back on that, you know, I kind of wish that someone had sat me down and, you know, had kind of coffee with me and, just, you know, shared with me kind of the basics of management, because that was what I was looking for. I remember reading a number of wonderful leadership books, um, and you know, many of them uh, helped me along the way, but they also seemed like they were written by people who were far more experienced than I was, you know, people who had been CEOs and who had uh, been studying organizations for you know, dozens of years and were trying to help executives take their organization to the next level. And the book that I was looking for was really, you know, teach me the basics, teach me management 101, tell me how I'm going to go and do a one-on-one, -on -one, how I should think about meetings, how I should think about recruiting. And, you know, this is someone who's never done it all before and hasn't gone through a lot of training courses or maybe have seen this path over 10 or 20 years. Tell me, tell me what that's like for a manager in that position. And that's, you know, the story that I wanted to write about. And, you know, that's the book that uh, I hope can find other people who are in a position like me uh, and who could find it useful. Well, I think you nailed it because your story is so similar to mine, right? Like, like you, I was a pretty successful independent producer. 
And unfortunately, those uh, sets of skills got me promoted to be a manager. And just this morning, I was being interviewed by a newspaper for Franklin Covey about our own point of view. And I said the exact same thing to the reporter. I said, I wish that someone would have told me, Scott, you're being promoted. Now, by the way, all of these skills that served you well in your previous jobs, those are great. But most of those aren't going to translate into what you need to learn now as a leader. So leave behind what you need to. Take forward. But here are some new things that you have to learn. I think you faced a very similar pivot point. Absolutely. And I think, you know, most importantly was, you know, how do you transition from doing the job and being someone who does it well? In my case, I was a designer. Uh, and, you know, how do you transition from being an individual contributor who was making all those decisions on the ground about what the design should be and where the pixels should go? And, you know, should we use this button or that button and start to think about not just doing the work yourself, but how do you help a team achieve great outcomes in, in doing that work together? In fact, Julie, that's kind of the foundational premise of the book. You open it with this you know, quite bold statement, your job as a manager is to get better outcomes from a group of people working together. How did you come about with not that profound but very practical point of view? Because it really is the premise of the book. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've feel actually that this is something that I came to over maybe a decade of, of managing because in the beginning I was besieged by today what seemed like not necessarily misconceptions of management, but, but maybe a more short-sighted view. I know that when I was 25 and I took over the job, you know, when I said yes to being a manager, my conception of manager was that I had to support my team. And that's not wrong, right? We all know managers do support their team, but I thought that supporting your team meant that you stood up for them, you know, you helped them solve their problems, you you were someone that they liked, uh, you know, you uh, could assign them to roles. Then over time, you know, they all became kind of like a series of tasks, and I realized I didn't actually understand. Well, what is what are all these tasks for? Like, what is the greater end? And uh, you know, over time, if you just keep distilling it all the way down to, well, why do you know, why are teams formed? Uh, it's usually because there's a goal, right? There's something that the team is trying to do together. And it's the belief that a group of people can do that thing better than a single individual can. And, you know, that's why we work together with other people. That's why we have teams. That's why we collaborate. And, you know, it's going all the way down to that core principle of, okay, so there's clearly an outcome we need to achieve. And that's the goal, you know, that's the North Star. That's what we're all trying to strive towards. And so, you know, the job of a manager is to just ensure that, you know, is this team working as efficiently as, as it can? Is this team composed of the right people who are going to be able to achieve that mission, whatever that mission may be? Julie, let's talk about the very crucial pivot point moving into management for the first time. I, I happen to believe from my own experience and my own writings that most people are lured into management and not led, meaning they want to become a manager because they think it's either just the next, you know, necessary rung on the ladder, I want to earn more money, uh, you know, lead or be led. Either, you know, either I have to take the job or my colleague down the hall who I don't like is going to be my boss next week. I think that too often people don't really understand why they're taking that role. What advice would you give people to ask themselves should I be in management? Should I become a leader of people? What are some of the questions people should ask themselves? The first thing I always ask is, do you get more satisfaction out of the outcome being achieved or in playing a particular role in getting to that outcome? Uh, because that to me is, is maybe the most uh, defining and ultimate question for whether or not you're going to be a great manager or or find satisfaction in the role of being a manager. Because if you say there's a thing I love to do, you know, whether it's writing code, whether it's uh, designing products, whether it's you know, uh, perfecting or getting better at the craft uh, of a particular discipline, uh, then you, know, you might actually not enjoy a lot of the day-to-day -day management. Because again, management is about how do I get a group of people to get to this great outcome? Because if that's the question that you're asking yourself every day, there isn't just one role you're playing. You know, every day you have to go through the list of what do I think is going to most help my team, and what can I do that it, you know is is uh, is going to be the most helpful. And you know, I always tell people, you know, maybe you don't like recruiting, maybe you don't like spending all your time calling candidates and having coffee with them and trying to convince them to you know join your your merry band. 
if that's the thing your team needs because you're down maybe four or five, you know, great people, then guess what? You're going to be spending 70, 80, 90% of your time doing exactly that because that is what your team needs to thrive and to be able to achieve their goal. It doesn't matter if that's not your favorite job, it's what you have to do. Similarly, maybe you have great talent, but you know, your processes are a mess. You know, meetings are not well defined. Maybe no one knows what they're going to do. You're going to need to be spending all your time defining processes. And maybe that doesn't sound sexy, but that is what, again, your team needs to do. And so being a manager means, you know, again, uh, you know, doing the things, maybe you don't like them, but you do them because you're getting satisfaction out of the outcome. Because, you you know, by bringing that group of people and helping them uh, be successful, enabling them to, you know, do their best work, you know, that's that's where you get uh, satisfaction from the job. So to me, that is probably the single most important question. Do you get more satisfaction out of get, seeing an outcome achieved than whatever role you play in it? The second question I ask um, is, is just frankly, you know, do you like working with other people? Um, because I am personally an introvert, uh, but uh, the the but I also am not daunted by the idea of being in meetings, basically back to back, talking with other people, working with groups of people. I know many folks, you know, who have tried to encourage courage into management, um, who have I've said, hey, you know, you have all the skills, you're talented, you know, people like you, you're a natural leader, da, da, da. Why don't you try managing? They do it for a year, they do it for two years, and they're miserable right. because they don't, they, they get, their energy gets sapped from having to, you know, interact with other people all day long, having to be in back-to-back -back meetings, you know, having to talk to this person or that person or, you know, work on a project with, with this group of people. Uh, and and if you're the kind of person who just really likes working by yourself, you know, and having time to focus, concentrate, think about problems, uh, and that's that's the most satisfying aspect of it for you, then maybe management will also be a, a little bit challenging for you to enjoy. Julie, I think it's so well said. Uh, on a previous episode, I interviewed the author of this recent book called Lean Out. Uh, that was a bit of a play on Sheryl Sandberg's book Lean In. And she worked both at Facebook and at Google some time ago. And she t said, you know, she wasn't quite sure that she was naturally called to leadership because she just said quite vulnerably, I like doing the work. I, I like to actually, you know, be an independent producer, kind of get in and get out. And I thought that's a great question to ask yourself. Like you said, do you like doing the work or do you like enjoying the outcomes? I think too often, and you share a great story in the book about a member of your team that was promoted into leadership and then quit. We've all seen it because when you promote someone into management or leadership too soon or for the wrong reasons and it doesn't work out, everybody loses because now you've lost you know, your best designer and you've also lost your leadership pipeline and they've lost the ability to return to their job. In most cases, I think that, that, um, that discernment process, if you will, is so valuable as you're thinking about pivoting into management. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And if you also, you know, promote someone into management and you know they're doing it to your point for the wrong reasons they're doing it because they want power uh, you know because they like to tell their people what to do then you, the rest of the team is not going to be very happy with that person and you're not going to get great outcomes and you know you're going to have to work yourself out of that mess um, and and everyone suffers you know julie i'm uh, privileged to be co-authoring a book coming out in a in a short while for the company called everyone deserves a great manager it's different but similar to some of the concepts that you've written. And we debated fiercely here about should the book be called Everyone Deserves a Great Manager or Everyone Deserves a Great Leader. And you actually talk about the difference between management and leadership from your point of view in your book. Would you just kind of talk for a few minutes around how you see the differences and the similarities? So I think of management as a job. It's a role. You know, it's sort of like being a teacher or a heart surgeon, right? There's particular, you know, responsibilities. And again, your responsibilities or the way that you're measured is likely um, some combination of what your team is expected to do, the metrics of success and whether or not, you know, you're able to achieve them. That's how you're going to get judged as to whether you're doing a good job in your role. I think of leadership as more of a quality or a trait, and leadership, being a great leader, simply means that people are willing to follow you. They're inspired by you. you know, they're, they're listening to what you're saying. And you have an ability to be able to rally people around a particular cause, mission, you know, project, initiative, whatever. 
And you know, managers to be successful in achieving great outcomes likely need to be great leaders because if your team doesn't want to listen to you, doesn't respect you, doesn't trust you, you're not gonna be able to be successful in those outcomes. However, I think that many, many people outside of managers can exhibit leadership. And I always tell people, you know, especially if they are growing and, uh, you know, they're becoming quite senior in their role, whether as designers, engineers, whatever, and many come to me and they say, you know, should I be a manager? I want to be a leader. And I always say, don't confuse the two because you can continue to lead and be a great leader in the capacity of your role as an individual contributor. Uh, or you can you know, lead and be a manager, but management is not the only way to be a leader. And I think it's very important for people to hear that because you know, we all want to be leaders. We all want to grow in our ability to influence and have uh, impact over broader and broader groups of people. Management is not the only way to get there. Yeah, in fact, I'm often uh, saying more in my own keynotes that everyone has leadership capability within them. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean necessarily you are a formal leader of people, right? Not everyone should be a leader of people, but everybody has the ability to lead at some point. In fact, mm -hmm. you're both, right? I mean, you are the vice president of product design. You lead people. You're also, at heart, you mentioned a designer as well. Are there some things that you had to leave behind when you moved from being an individual contributor designer to becoming a leader manager of people? What are some of the things you had to say, you know what, that is the old job, that's the old competency, I have to have a new mindset now about you know, leading people and getting work done with and through other people? And did you find yourself sometimes having to remind yourself not to do that anymore? Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, the, the thing I felt like I had to train in myself is whenever a thing came up, whenever there was a project or a problem or something that could be better, I had to train myself to flip from asking, what would I do to solve the problem? And change that question more to who can, who is the best position to solve this problem? And most of the time, the answer is not me. Uh, because people who are closer to the problem, who have more time to spend on the problem, you know, who have more context around and the network of relationships around, you know, other people who are involved in the problem, those people are far better suited to solve the problem than I, I am. And that was a little challenging because, you know, I grew up, um, I went to school for engineering, you know, I kind of have an engineer's mindset of like, there's a problem, I want to start to immediately figure out what the solution is. And having to just train that mindset of, okay, it's not about me anymore and what I would do. It's about who and who can I task this to? Who can I, uh, you know, give ownership and uh, hold them accountable for doing it, but also set them up so that they can be successful to solve that problem? That's a huge shift and, you know, took uh, many, many years. And, and I still, you know, catch myself sometimes uh, eagerly, you know, starting to brainstorm instead of taking a step back and thinking about the team and thinking about, you know, uh, uh, who who is best structured. And I think, you know, I, I often go back to kind of delegation being one of the most important traits that managers need to learn, uh, you know, especially as they transition from being an individual contributor to a manager. Uh, and for me, the rule of thumb on delegation is, you know, yourself as, as, as the manager of the team, you should be spending your time at the intersection of, you know, most important problems for my team and things that I can solve better than anyone else on the team. Because if someone can do something better than you and can solve a problem better, absolutely they should be able to do it. And similarly, if something is not maybe the one, the top one, two, or three most critical priorities for your team, you should also think about how to delegate that to, to someone else. Um, where you should really play is in you know, top priorities as well as your better position to do this than anybody else. You know, Julie, as I, like you, started as an individual producer and then moved up, if you will, kind of the chain of command, uh, I'm now an officer at Franklin Covey, I report to the CEO. I just turned 51 within the last year, and I came to a bit of a self-awareness epiphany, and that was that up until I read Liz Wiseman's book, Multipliers, which is an amazing leadership book, I felt like my job was to be the smartest person in the room, the most creative, the, the, uh, that the buck stopped with me, and I had to be the pro person responsible for all of the solutions. And as a result, I tended to, horrifyingly, hire very smart people, but people who I thought were just a little bit not as smart as me. 
I was probably arrogant. They probably were smarter than me, but I wanted my, my value, my stature, my position to be secure, and I was quite fearful of hiring talent that I thought would eclipse me. And then I just had this, I'm embarrassed to admit, this news flash in my 50s that said, no, 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 that isn't my job. My job is to hire people who are smarter than me, obviously, clearly, glaringly smarter than me, and I'm kind of the glue. My job is to be a talent magnet and move them around the company. Have you experienced any of that, or is that just my own narcissism? What advice would you give to leaders who are you know, naturally concerned about their own stature in the company, but they need yes. to come to that maturity that you don't have to have all the answers. You won't always fix everything. What, what advice would yes. you give people? So I, I had the same exact experience as you, except for me, it was, you know, I was asked to be a manager. I was 25 years old and my huge hangup for those first few years, you know, especially even my very first one-on-one -on -one, uh, with a member of my, you know, new team, suddenly, you know, he reported to me the day before we were peers. Uh, I didn't know what to say to him because I always respected this person as a better designer. You know, he had gone to design school. He had a lot more experience building and designing products. You know, he had a command of typography that I did not have. And I struggled, you know, I asked myself, well, why am I his manager? I'm sure he's not gonna respect me because I'm not better than him at this particular, you know, thing that we do called design. And so how am I going to support him? How am I going to have the, you know, the ability to influence him or tell him what to do? Like, why would he even listen to me? I'm sure he resents me. I'm sure he, you know, is not happy about the fact that I'm here today as his manager. And these were insecurities that I felt for, you know, uh, months and years going into the job, right? Because to your point, you know, when someone comes in and they're a little bit less experienced than us. They're a little bit, you know, uh, more junior to us. It feels comfortable because we know, you know, we know their path, right? We know how to support them and guide them because oftentimes we ourselves went through that same path. So it feels like we're, you know, talking to a person uh, who is similar to ourselves, who is maybe, you know, some years behind and that feels really comfortable. But yeah, I came to the same realization as you that again, if we go back to, okay, what are we here to do as managers? And it's to get great outcomes from our team. You know, the number one lever that managers have is people and talent. And if you can get your team to, let's say, you know, be twice as skilled, right? Or uh, twice as good as, as what they do, you're probably gonna have much better output. You know, you're gonna have better outcomes as a team. And so, you know, being able to both hire talented, amazing people, the best that you can find, as well as helping to coach, you know, great people to that next level, that is, you know, a huge portion of what uh, management is all about and what, you know, a great manager should be spending his or her time focused on. And the thing I had to tell myself is, you know, you don't have to be better than somebody on your team at a right. particular skill to be useful as a coach, to be helpful. And you know, my best analogy is like you look at someone like Serena Williams or you look like you look at any elite athlete and they have a coach. Sometimes they have multiple coaches and, you know, those coaches are not playing the sport like, you know, Serena Williams tennis coach is not a better tennis player than she is. But yet it would be unthinkable for her to not have a coach, right, to assume that she was so good because she's the best in the world that she didn't need that and she could just help herself. Coaching help is, is, you know, coaches help you be aware of, uh, uh, you know, your blind spots. They encourage you, you know, they can help you uh, develop a plan uh, that enables you to do your best work. Um, and I think the best coaches oftentimes are, are kind of mirrors for ourselves that help us better understand ourselves and help us, you know, work through those things, uh, those barriers that are inhibiting our own performance. Julie, the book is a gem. I, I thoroughly enjoyed reading it, and I've spent my entire career in this leadership management development industry. Uh, I, I've been um, you know, responsible for launching the majority of our books. I love books, as you can see in the set, and I, and I think this is a great read for anyone. I want to end our discussion with my favorite part of the book. It's actually on page 89. I won't quiz you. I'll set you up. <laughs> you talk about how every major disappointment is a failure to set expectations. It's a, it's a topic that I'm super passionate about. One of our own thought leaders, Blaine Lee, he passed about a decade ago. He wrote a book called The Power Principle, Influence with Honor. 
And the one thing that I took away from Dr. Blaine Lee, who was one of Dr. Covey's original confidants and, and very good friends, he said, loosely quoted, nearly all, if not all, conflict in life comes from mismatched or unfulfilled expectations. And I think it's so true with your boss, your colleagues, your wife, your mother-in-law, whatever it is, you know, setting clear expectations is so important. And you, you dedicate a part of the book. Why did you write about this? Whether there's some personal experiences, I think it's a major aha for people to understand the importance of setting and clarifying expectations. You know, I think at the end of the day, as whether it's as people or whether it's as teams that are trying to do something, right? Um, being, you know, the thing that 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 uh, messes us up oftentimes is just miscommunication. You know, it's I assume that you know because I want to do this thing or I think that this is what's right or you know I think that you know this is what uh, you you want me to do that and, and but you know i have a completely different view and it's not actually what you think or it's not actually what the boss thinks or it's not you know actually what the ceo wants and that's when we get into trouble you know we're talking past each other because we all assume that we know what other people want and the reality of the situation is that we are all different you know we are unique we come from different backgrounds we have different contexts we view the same set of facts in a different light and being explicit about you know, what it is we think our job is or what it is that we want or what it is that we think, you know, our team is meant to come do together or how do we define success? All of that is really critical for groups of people who are different, unique individuals to come together and achieve something. And so to me, you know, every time, like, I, I feel like I've disappointed you because you thought I was going to do X and I didn't, I did Y, it's probably because of a misunderstanding. And so the next time we start, let's sit together and let's talk about, you know, what you think I'm doing, what I think you should be doing, what our shared definition of success is, and take that time to listen and to explicitly communicate those things. Julie, who do you credit for your extraordinary wisdom at such a young age? I credit all of the people that I've ever worked with, the people who took a chance on me, you know, all, obviously my parents, uh, but, you know, most importantly, you know, all of my amazing colleagues at Facebook, this is the company that I grew up in. This is the company where I had the opportunity to uh, be in the, you know, uh, roles that I was in and to grow and to have uh, peers and mentors who were honest with me uh, and helped me along the way and gave me the opportunities to grow. Julie, if you could pull the book back a couple of months and insert a learning that you wished you would have said differently or you didn't include, is there anything that as you've now you know, talked with you know, thousands of audiences and webcasts and podcast interviews, anything that you left on the cutting room floor that you might have chosen to put back in? One of the things that I get asked a lot and I do wish uh, I'd spend a little bit maybe more time on it in the book is, you know, what about from the perspective of someone who uh, isn't, a manager yet, but maybe who's thinking about becoming a manager, you know, what are, what, what advice would I give to them? And the biggest thing that I always say to people is, you know, make your intentions known. And a lot of times, you know, this is true for, for, I think anybody, whether we're in managers, whether, or, uh, or whether we're not, uh, the more that you can be intentional about where you want your career to go. And again, explicitly tell your manager or the people around you, you know, what your goals are. If you want to, for example, one day lead a team, if you want to one day manage the team, if you want to, you know, become a better public speaker or become a better engineer or become a better designer, say those things, right? Tell people your actual goals, because that's the only way that you're going to have them be able to then give you feedback to help you grow your skills in that arena. It's the best way for people to be aware of what you care about so they can help you find those opportunities to do those things. Uh, so it goes back to that theme we were talking about, about you know explicit communication, setting clear expectations, but don't let people guess what you really want for your career. You know, Go out and uh, you know, define that for yourself. Make sure you know that, you know, you've re reflected on that for your own uh, future and then let the people know so that you can enlist their help. Julie, you've spent the majority of your career in high tech. I have not. The opposite. The majority of my career was in hospitality or here in professional services. Have you had any experience or have you formed a point of view 
that um, in the high tech world, which clearly magnetizes with, you know, we might say left brain thinkers and engineers and people who love process, obviously there's a creative component of that clearly with yourself and at Facebook and others. Do you find that people in the high tech world that have those natural left brain skills struggle more with the relationship skills essential to being a great manager and leader? Is there any advice you would give to people who naturally are either more introverted or, or more left brain oriented on things that they could do to help build their skills to be a better manager or leader? Or do you dispel that whole notion? Yeah, uh, well, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, qualities I do see in working in high tech as a manager, I think one of the first ones was just the, the speed of change, right, in the industry. And, you know, um, I'm an example of somebody who was at that company that, you know, grew from 100 people to 40,000 people in less than two decades, right? And in other industries or in historically, you know, that, that was just super rare. And we see that happening all the time in high tech environments. And so, you know, I think people who come and become managers in those environments, you know, you're sort of really push to be flexible. You're pushed to uh, deal with issues of extreme growth. And you're kind of pushed to be really, frankly, uncomfortable a lot of the time because, you know, you haven't done this before. Or the company hasn't done this before. Uh, maybe even the industry hasn't done it before because you're you know at the cutting edge of some disruptive new market. Uh, and so I think flexibility is a huge, huge aspect of you know a lot of the qualities of managers that I see. But you know to your point, you know being able to even in in, in spite of a very dynamic and fast changing environment, you know how do we take the time to truly connect? with the individuals on our team? How do we understand them as people? How do we empathize? Because at the end of the day, you know, any manager report relationship is like any relationship. It's going to be built on trust. And, you know, one of the things that, uh, that I think, you know, we do need to continue to emphasize in the tech industry is that care for individuals. It's that ability to, you know, uh, maybe not just always focus on the task at hand, but kind of getting to know uh, people, getting to know what their values are, what they care about, and how we can position them to be able to, you know, have the greatest impact for the team. I think there are also benefits of being, uh, you know, a kind of a, a systematic thinker. And a lot of times it's, you yeah. know, coming up with frameworks mm -hmm. or coming up with uh, maybe you, know, you call it engineering systems uh, that, that help, uh, uh, you know, improve outcomes for uh management. I think one of the things that as always, you know, we, we sometimes talk about and joke about is, you know, management is still one of those um, one uh, areas where it's so human, right? Uh, it's, you know, it's hard to imagine that a machine could do this uh, because, you know, it, it's so much about human relationships, but there are probably things that, you know, we could, that better data can help us uh, enable as managers. So for example, can we do a better track tra uh, job of tracking, you know, uh, outcomes? Can we do a better job job of understanding if individual managers are having the effect that they wish they were having, you know, with their individual teams, you know, what can we build to kind of help uh, with that level of relationship building or collaboration? And it's kind of exciting to see some of the developments, you know, even with products that, uh, that help teams manage more effectively. Julie, you've got a lot going on. You're now a best-selling author. You're a leader at Facebook. You're a, a, a mom of two, and you're a, a spouse. Uh, what's you write a very popular blog? What's next for you? Uh, I think continuing to do all of those things that I love, you know, which is building great products, thinking about, um, you know, how we can use technology to enable uh, healthier and better relationships, and. Uh, uh, thinking about that in the context of, you know, the company and the organization as well. Julie Zhu, author of the book, The Making of a Manager, What to Do When Everyone Looks to You. Thank you for joining Franklin Covey on Leadership. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful conversation, Scott. For us as well. Great success to you. Thank you for joining us. Pick up the book. It's phenomenal. From someone who knows a bit about the book industry, writing books on this topic, which I've now authored or co-authored too, I think Julie's book is an absolute gem. Thanks for joining us on Leadership, and we'll see you back here next week.